2011, where I put this massive bet on that the economy will collapse and I make $11 million. And the maddest thing is the next memory I have is I'm sitting on the desk and I felt like I was going to start crying. You know what poverty is like? You never go shopping, everything is a hand-me-down. If you go to the shop, you buy the cheapest thing in the shop. For years, for lunch, I ate two scotch eggs for 75 pence. And then one day somebody drops 400 grand on your head. And you realise that me and my family and a million families like that are forced into this horrible masquerade of struggling for food so that a bunch of guys in skyscrapers can make a million fucking pounds a year. Okay, before we get into the episode, I have one huge favor, which is please subscribe to the channel. We went from having 700 subscribers to over 50,000 subs, and I never imagined that I would get there. I actually have a crazy goal at the moment, which is we just went past the 50,000 subscriber mark, and in the next 60 days, I want to hit 100,000 subscribers. It will really help us scale the channel, improve the production, and every little part of what we do. And so I will need your help to satisfy that goal. Please just take a second to subscribe to the channel. It helps us immeasurably. And thank you for watching. Now on to the episode. You came from humble beginnings, but by the age of 25, you were a millionaire. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into that, but I wanted to start with a line in the book that just stood out to me. And you say, a lot of rich people expect poor people to be stupid. Yeah. And it's like reading the book at a, pill at a pretty early stage, there's like this divide that's established, right? It's like the rich and the poor, the haves and the have nots. And so I'm just curious that when you reflect kind of on your childhood and like those early formative moments, when was that first realization that that was even the case in society, that you had the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots? I think it comes in, in steps, really. So, so I grew up in East London, quite a poor area, like a little terrace street, like a tiny little bedroom, sharing a bunk bed with my brother, train going through the back garden. But even on my street, we were like one of the poor families. I think the, the first thing that you... You realise for me, so in this country, we still have this thing called the 11 plus. You know, 11 plus, I guess Americans won't know it. So this is like a historical thing where you make all the kids take an exam at 10 years old. And that is when you decide like whether this kid is smart or not. And if he's smart, he gets sent to like this like special fancy school. And um, I passed that test and I got sent to this fancy school. And it was only really there that I saw people that were like really significantly richer than, than me and my family. I remember there was one kid in that school, his, his parents were but well his dad was a banker and um i went into his house one time and he had a staircase that like split and went in two directions i was like this guy's got a staircase that splits you know what i mean but then when i was at that fancy grammar school that's what we call it this fancy school grammar school for americans who might not know even there nobody expected me to be stupid because i think you go in at 11 years old and you're you know we, everyone's wearing the same uniform, you go in and everyone's doing the same maths exam and everybody can see that you're smart, really. It wasn't until I was 18 and I went to LSE, the London School of Economics. So the London School of Economics, right, again, some people might not know what that is, right? This university, way less famous than Oxford or Cambridge, but it's basically as prestigious and as hard to get into, pretty much. And like, this is the school where, like Oxford and Cambridge is really where, really where like British blue bloods and like very wealthy Europeans send their kids to Oxford and Cambridge. Whereas LSE is like international money. So it will be like, like Gaddafi, like the dictator of Libya sent his kids there. And it's like that kind of thing. It's like very, very wealthy Indians, Pakistanis, loads and loads of Chinese, you know, Russians, Middle Eastern people, like, you know, people from poor African countries. Like there was a, there was a guy in my class who's, dad owned basically the entire East African soap industry. So like you, you get there and what you see there is like, these guys are like crazy rich. Like they're properly, properly rich. Their dads are like super, super rich. And it was only, it was a lot, it was actually from that guy whose dad owned the East African soap industry. <laughs> He's called Sagamalde, who, um, to be honest, it was the same, right? These guys were really, really rich now. And I think kind of the story of the book and the story of my life is you keep going up a level and being like, damn, these guys are rich. And then you go like up another level and be like, dad, these guys are like really, really rich. But I was at LSE and still I was always, I knew I was poor, 
But I was doing maths and economics there and I always back myself if we're studying maths, right? And first year uni, to be honest, I found it quite easy. I got like quite good grades. I come in second year, suddenly everybody knew who I was. Like people, and people would like come up to me, like these really like fancy, like, like Europeans with fantastic hair would be like, oh, hey, do you want to study together? And I'd be like, who is this person? You know? And I asked this guy, Sagamalde, this Kenyan boy, Kenyan Indian, his, his dad owned all of these factories. Why does everybody know who I am? And he goes, oh, because of your grades. And this guy, Saga, actually, he was number one in first year maths department. So like better grades than mine. I said to him, well, why does everybody know? Your grades are better than mine. And he just said to me, like, calm as you like. Yeah, of course. But nobody expected that from you. And that was the first time I really realized it because up until that point, yeah, I was poor, but I was smart. And it was only, I think what you have here once you get to that level is, these kinds of people, and I don't at all want to say they're bad people. This guy's like Malde, lovely guy, still a really good friend of mine, right? Really nice guy. You meet him, you'll love him. He'll show you around the soap factories. You'll have a great time. But these guys just do not interact with people from poor background. Once you get to that level, you know, all they know is their cleaners and their nannies. You know what I mean? Like they don't, they, they, so they reach a point where they can genuinely believe that poor people are dumb, basically. Mm. You know, it's so interesting in the book because especially that moment when you go to LSE, because it's like you're in a new world. It's like your first entrance into this new world. And before we get to that, I want to talk about something that you mentioned very early in your answer when you said that uh, you grew up in quite a poor area, but even within that, even on your street, you were one of the poorer yeah. um, families. And so I'm just curious, like, what did that, how did that look in your life? Like if you almost wanted to take people behind the curtain and, and give them that true sense of like, what was almost the day of the life of Gary in that, in that time you growing up? Yeah, that's, that's a good question actually, because I know you grew up in London as well and I don't know too much what your childhood was like, but even when you're poor and you're surrounded by poor people, there's still this, this difference, right? So I grew up in a place called Ilford. It's like a bit further out in East London. So it's not like your classic like Cockney East End. Um, very, very migrant area. When I was a kid, still now, massively South Asian. So we're talking about British Indians, British Pakistanis, mostly that's what I grew up with. And little terraced street, being between the high street and the railway, you know, kids are out playing football on the street. There was a recycling centre at the end where we just like play football, get told, like, get told off, get sent in. I think the differences were really, everybody lived in the same kind of tiny house. But like, I had a friend, he's in the book, he's called Harry Sambi. And in his house, it was just him and his mum. But in my house, it was me and my mum and my dad and my brother and my sister. So even though it's the same house, we are way poorer than them, right? Because we have five people in the house and they've got two people in the house. And it's like crowded in and everything sort of, it's one of them things, you know, people will be watching from different backgrounds. But in my, it's like if something breaks, it don't get fixed. You know what I mean? And you come into the house and... To be honest, it was only really like years later. My parents only left that house a couple of years ago. You would, I would go back in as an adult and I'd be like, this house is kind of bust up. You know what I mean? Like it hasn't been redecorated since the seventies. You know what I mean? You can see, but as a kid, you don't really realize it. But one thing I remember was when I went to this grammar school, a good friend of mine came around and he was like, what's happening to your house? And I was like, what, what do you mean? He was like, he's like, dude, your house is shaking. And I was like, what? And, and he's like, your house is shaking. I was like, and then I realized like, the trains go right past the back of the house, right? And like genuinely, realistically, when the train goes past the house shakes. But if you've been living with that since you was a baby, you don't even realize your house is shaking, right? But what is this? It's little things like you go to your friend's house in, you're in primary school, you go to your friend's house and like, she's got her own bedroom and it's like big. And it's like, she's got like, it's like decorated for like what she is, which is like a young girl. You know what I mean? It's got like Barbie posters and stuff like this. And you realize like some people have their houses, like their rooms decorated for them. You know what I mean? And then I was, my parents are Mormons. So when I grew up, I was going to church and um, you really saw that inequality there because I remember like the bishop of the local church was like an American investment banker. He worked for Deutsche Bank and you went to this guy's house and just like the, the space, the space. But then also what, what you also saw at church, I don't want to pretend I was the poorest guy in London because I wasn't. You would also, I think I saw like families growing up in small council flats. 
you know what I mean? Worse off than mine. So I think um, you see it bouncing, you, you know, you turn 16 and your mates will get cars. I remember one thing I really remember is when we all turned 16 and like my friend's parents, so I grew up in this very like British Indian community. And for most of these families, education was so important. And they'd all be like, for every A star you get, we'll give you like 500 pounds or something. And then they, when they, they would all get cars based on their grades. And you know, my grades were the best in the school, you know what I mean? But we hit 16, everybody gets a car. And I remember these two girls talking to like, oh my God, have you seen Raj's new car? He must be doing really well for himself. And I remember thinking, we're 16. <laughs> what do you think Raj is doing? You know? And you know, I was working a paper round and as soon as I could get like a Sunday job, I got a Sunday job. Whereas everyone else is focusing on the exams. But I think as a kid, and I don't know how you find it growing up in London. I didn't ever really stop and be like, this is unfair, this is unfair. I was just like, well, I have to make it for myself. I have to make it for myself. What, what's my way out? What's my way out? And obviously being in London, being in East London, we had the financial district, like not far away. We saw there's like a, so in London, there's two financial districts. You'll know, but I guess some of the, some of the listeners won't know. There's the old one, which is the city in the center. And there's this new like skyscraper district in East London, in what was, what used to be one of the poorest parts of London. All these skyscrapers went up and we saw them go up when we was about eight or nine. And it, for me, you know, one of the opening scenes of the book is me sort of playing football in the street, looking at these skyscrapers and being like, that's my way out, that's my way out. So I, I didn't really think about inequality. I just thought about what's the plan basically. Mm. You know, actually, just on that point, there's this quote from the book. You say, I remembered sitting with Jamie, a childhood friend, on top of the multi-story car park in the nighttime, watching the new skyscrapers go up around us in our city and telling him that I was going to be somebody someday, promising him that I would do that. He'd laugh at me, but he knew that I would. And so did I. What gave you so much certainty? Um, you know... I went to a regular school and I was always like the smart kid in the class, right? Then you pass this fancy exam and you go to like the smart boys school. It was a boys only school that I went to. And um, you kind of think like now we're going to be with all the smart kids, you know? But then I went there and yeah, I don't want to boast or nothing, but I was still quite effortlessly like the smartest kid in that school. And then you, you get a little bit of jealousy because it's a funny one because now everybody's gone to that school. They're all the smart kids in their primary school. And now you come in here and, you know, some of these guys are not that smart and I'm beating basically everyone. And I was that kind of kid in school, that annoying kid that like sits at the back of the class, like making like smart aleck jokes and like still coming first in all the exams. And I wasn't even really studying. And people would be like, we know you study, we know you're studying. They were thinking it was kind of like a, like a little game I was playing. But then you come to my house, there weren't no desk in my house. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't studying. I was out on the streets like every, every, not doing nothing, you know, when I, just playing football, you know what I mean? But and then you kind of realise like, and then I, I got into the school maths team. And then as soon as I got into the school maths team, we're winning every competition. So like, you realise I've got something, you know, and it's, it's, it's not something that I really ever worked for, but you just see like, I've got this thing. And, you know, I think it's, it's that confidence that gets put, I think you often see the opposite thing happen, like, especially in things like maths. People get given this idea, oh, I'm terrible at maths in their head, you know, because they fall behind when they're six years old or something. But I think school gave me this, the opposite idea, which is if there's a fair game and it's about maths, it's about numbers, you win because I, I kept winning when I was a kid, I think. So I think, I think it's that people do ask me this, where does this confidence come from? I suppose it comes from that, but you know, I did keep winning when it comes, I, I don't want to give the impression like I'm like some genius is amazing at everything, but these specific things like maths stuff, I think that's just kind of like how my brain works when it comes to like maths analytical stuff. So yeah, I suppose it came from school and I should give credit to my mum who always, who noticed when I was young that I love numbers. I was just that, I was that kind of kid that had to have a little mathematical system for everything. Like this is mad, right? If we, if we went to the corner shop and my mum give me 20p, I had the mathematical system to decide what sweets I would buy. That's just the kind of weird, sometimes I wonder if I'm on the spectrum or something a little bit, but just I love maths and numbers from young and, you know, the world showed me that I had a talent and I wanted to see how far it would go. Yeah. You know what? I think when we're growing up, there's so many influences around us. There's so many things that are happening, people doing different things. Um, some of it on either side of the law, even. Mm. And so... I think a large part of your story is all 
is obviously the success that you had academically. But there's also like another side to it, especially um, that kind of like last year that you were in school. Kind of give people that insight. When I got expelled from school? Yeah. Yeah, so when I just, just turned 16, about a year before my exams, I got expelled from school for selling drugs, for selling cannabis, for selling like two pounds or three pounds worth of cannabis, tiny, tiny amount of cannabis. And, um, you know, I wouldn't describe myself as a drug dealer, but, you know, I pass this exam and I go to this fancy school and it's quite far from where I live, right? And I'm one of the poorest kids in the school and there's nobody from my sort of area. And, you know, you, go, you come to my street, there's kids playing around and, you know, once you become, everybody knows everyone. And once you get to sort of 13, 14, you know, you can get drugs. You can get drugs. You know, I don't know what your child was like in London, but maybe you understand this kind of thing, right? You know, there's three or four doors on my street I can knock on and I can, I can, I can buy drugs. And um, my mates at school, they're living in these houses with stairs that split into two, you know what I mean? And they don't know where to buy drugs on the street. And they would know, you know what I mean? They would see the people I was hanging around with and they would just kind of basically stereotype, you know, Gary can get drugs. And they would come and ask me, you know, can you get me drugs? And, you know, these guys had a lot of money. I didn't have no money. And they were asking me, can you get me drugs? So, you know, I would sort of do this and it would happen. Um, but then, you know, one thing happened, we got caught, I got expelled. And it was like, it's mad because, because I was like kind of the smart kid in the school. And it was also a fancy school, you know, at that school, in the, in the assembly hall, they had on the, li on the walls every year, the kids that were going to Oxford and Cambridge. And everybody just assumes you're going to be on that, Gary Stevens is going to be on this wall, you know what I mean? Then one day you get expelled, next thing is, people think you're going to go to prison, you know what I mean? And then people just assume, you know, Gary, Gary fucked up. I might have to swear, by the way. Yeah. Like, and he's done. And then I remember, you know, they called my dad in, my dad took me home and I remember waking up in the middle of the night and my mum was like crying. And I remember thinking, why are you crying? You're not going to fix this. It sounds harsh, but that's what I thought. Because the truth is, you, you know, you come from where I come from. You make one mistake. You don't normally come back from that. But um, the next morning I woke up, my mum and my dad were both at work. My brother was at work. My sister was at school. And you're like, oh, you got nowhere to go. For the first time in your life, you know, you, got, you wake up and you're like, well, you got nowhere to go, basically. I went downstairs, I took a shower. And in my house, there was like a little bathtub and you had to like take this rubber thing and put it on the taps and I like, use this shower head. And um, just so you had to sit down in the bath to shower and watching the water go down the drain and thinking like, mate, that's your life, mate. That's gonna be your life if you don't do nothing. And one of my mates come around like, you wanna go a smoke? And I was like, no, I'm not gonna smoke. And uh, there weren't no desk in my house. There were, I had this little wooden board. You put the board on the floor in the front room. You would lie on the floor and you would do your homework. And that's what I did every day lying at home on the floor in my front room, doing my homework every day. And I got A stars and three A's a year later. It was, and I had to find a new school to go to and I had to go and say, you know, I've got like straight A stars and expelled for drugs, which was an interesting experience. But I tell you, it kicked me into shape. I never took drugs since. And I think that, that is a blessing because, you know, I've seen, I tell you what, one, one story in the book, like a running theme is that people from my sort of background, people from poor backgrounds get, kind of convinced that, that we're dumb. And I, I don't think people from my background are dumb, but there's a set of hurdles put in their way. And a big one of them is drugs. A massive one of them is drugs. The number of people, smart, really smart, bright, intelligent, athletic kids I've seen get sucked into drugs and it sucked the life out of them. And I think it was, in a weird way, it was the best thing that ever happened to me getting expelled because it stopped me and I never took drugs since and it, and it started me working and, and it probably gave me that kind of independent streak which helped me throughout my career. Mm. No, it sounds like it was a real, like a real wake up call. And I'm curious in that moment of when you get expelled and you see the emotion that your mum has. And I'm sure even in your own internal narrative, it's like, you're this kid with so much promise. The, the academics is coming easy. Things are coming easily to you. And you even have this confidence. It's not just the promise. It's also the confidence of like, I'm going to be something. And the moment you get expelled, is there a sense that I just like blew it all? I think, uh, honestly, I, I was just turned 16, but I think like 
I still think then I was like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold this. I'm gonna hold this together. I can manage this. I can hold this together. I, I said, I've been doing this book to people. Obviously, you read the book, you get this sense of confidence. And I don't know where it come from. If it come from my family, if it come from my mum. I always believed myself. I, I always back. Obviously, you know now I'm not going to get to go to school, and maybe maybe that will be a problem. But um, yeah, I didn't think it would stop me. I, obviously, well, obviously, you know, there's some elements of luck, like you know, that was dealt with in house in the school, which means they never called the police. You know, if the police were called, I could have got a criminal record, which I think would have been crazy to give 16 year old kids criminal records and they can't get jobs. That didn't happen to me. Um, but I don't know why you, you see throughout the book, you see this, I come into new spaces and I always back myself. Like, I, I think I can do it. I think I can do it. Um, I don't know. Where, I don't know. I don't know where the confidence came from, but it didn't. It was hard. Uh, the hardest thing was being separated from my friends. You know what I mean? And having to be like, you know, 16 is, is young, young. And it's a lot. Obviously, now your mum, you know, your mum thinks you're a drug dealer. <laughs> you know, that's like a, <laughs> something to carry. But um I don't know from from I think I had that kind of vibe from young and I think it was good and it was bad I had this idea like I carry it on my shoulders I'm going to do it and I think the book kind of shows you the good and the bad side of that which is on the one hand you can achieve a lot of things if you're willing to take a lot of responsibility yourself but it had over the long run as I kept taking on more and more on my shoulders it had big negative impacts on my mental health which the book shows as well mm. yeah you know it is, it's, so, it's so much to deal with and I think um, one of the things that's most difficult as a kid is that feeling of like disappointing your parents. Like when your your mom or your dad, they're not even angry. They're just like disappointed. I feel like that's so hard to deal with. Yeah, I don't know. I'm the, you got brothers and sisters? Yeah. How many? I have quite a few. I have two brothers, three sisters. Oh, and what number are you? I'm the second. Okay. Second so oldest. So I'm the second of three. I think as the middle, you can kind of, you don't get noticed that much. But you know, my parents are not super materialistic people. Really, their priority is religion. That's their big thing. And I was never, you know, I started to, to become quite doubtful of, of Mormonism when I was quite young, probably like as young as maybe nine or 10. And um, I was kind of on my way out for a while and I stopped going when I was 15. And that, so my parents were already disappointed with me before I got expelled from school, really. It's funny in a way because you might think like the reason this kid wants so hard to be successful is because his parents want him to be successful. But actually, my parents are not, not super materialistic people. So that, that really come from the community around me. You know, I grew up in this very, very British Indian, British Pakistani community. And there is a very strong ethic in that community. Like we're here to make money to move up. Um, but I just, I thought I had a talent, you know, there's, there's a parable in the Bible, the parable of the talents, do you know? I don't know if you were raised religious, so it's, um, this, this idea, like this, the master goes out and he gives these coins to his servants and the coins are called talents. And he comes back and some of them have like invested in growing the money. And one of them is just like buried is in the ground. And he like, really is like, you shouldn't bury your talents in the ground. He's like, if you have a talent, you have a responsibility to use it. And like, I know most people from my background never get the opportunity to go to LSE, to go to Oxford, to be a trader in the city. But I did, and that's not because I'm better than other people. Like I had this talent from a young age and I felt like I had a responsibility to myself and to other people to just see how far it could take me. You know what I mean? So it wasn't really for my parents. Whether they're still disappointed, I don't know. They definitely would like me to go to church more. That's for sure. <laughs> you know what? I have this, um, I was speaking about, this with someone recently, which is, I feel like as humans, we're motivated really by two things when you boil it down. It's uh, inspiration and then desperation. And so when you even explain the parable of talents, that's like the inspiration, right? It's the wanting to maximize what I was given, my potential, my gifts. However, and, and I think it's actually, psychologists will say this, a much more powerful motivator is running away from the pain. Hundred. There was fear. There was definitely fear. Fear of being poor, and you know, my my parents. They grew up in an age where you know, neither of my parents went to university. Um, my mum only worked for a few years. My dad worked sort of on like average or less than average pay. So my dad worked for the post office for thirty five years, 
And on that, they was able to raise a family. Okay, we was poor, but you know, there was food on the table. You know what I mean? The, the, the rent got paid, the mortgage got paid. Um, but nowadays, it's so difficult to, to get that basic financial security that when you grow up poor, it's scary, man. You, you know, like if I don't make it, ain't nobody gonna come in and step in for me. You know, ain't nobody gonna take care of my kids, you know, so you're scared. There's a, like a story at the very, like super, super early in the book about when my parents sent me to the, to the gas station to buy like some lemonade with a pound coin and I dropped it. And I was just panicking, looking everywhere, looking everywhere for this pound coin. Like, it felt like I was looking for it for hours, you know, it, I was only probably six or seven, so it's probably 20 minutes, you know, but just, it is fear, I think, it is fear. And I think, I think even now, you know, I'm, you know, quite a wealthy person now. I think even now there is still inside me that little boy that, that is scared of being poor and knows that if I don't pull myself up, ain't nobody gonna pull me up. Mm. It's the responsibility that you mentioned earlier. You know what, the, the name, the title of the book is The Trading Game. And I think in a lot of ways, it's kind of like an analogy for the, for the story of your life. But there is literally a trading game. Yeah. And that's kind of your entry into the banking world and trading and all of this stuff. Break that down for people, the trading game. Okay, quick break. I think something that's so important to me with this show is that I want to do things differently. And here's what I mean. I've listened to so many podcasts where the experience and the conversation is interrupted by sponsors that as the audience, I don't care about. And so something that was really important to me is that when we do bring on sponsors and partners, they will be the correct partners that are advertising a product that my audience cares about. But in order to do that, I need your help. So linked in the description below is a five question survey. You can complete it in 90 seconds or less. And this is going to give us all of the information so that we can get sponsors that actually bring you value. And here's the deal that I'm going to make with you right now. If you answer that survey and you give us this information in just a second of your time, we're going to make everything about this show better. We're going to scale the guests. We're going to scale the production. Everything that goes into making this an amazing experience for you. So you answer the survey. We're going to take this to an even higher level. We're going to keep offering you more and more value. And so go to the link in the description. Help me help you. Now back to the show. All right, so there's the question of how do you get the job? And there's this kind of quite naive, simplistic idea that to get a good job, you work really hard at school and you get good grades. And that's basically not true. So like I did, well, I didn't work that hard, but I got very good grades and I got into LSE, which is this very fancy university. And I kind of just thought, study hard, you're gonna get a good job. But what actually happens is, and anybody who's been to like an elite university will relate to this. You come in second year, everybody goes totally mental. And like all they care about is applying for internships at banks. And people, at LSE, people start coming in to university wearing suits just for no reason, because they're kind of like, you know, become, become what you want to be. And um, they start talking entirely in like three letter acronyms, you know, CDSs, CDOs, MBSs, M&A, IBD, all this. And you're like, and they're applying for like 35 investment banks, right? And it's really stressful. Like, I don't know who tells them to do this stuff, but like, probably it's their families, right? They come in and they're doing this. And um, you don't have your grades at this point. So it, even if you've been studying well, like you can't be like, look, here's my grades. So what you're applying on is CV and cover letter. And what that means is you're basically applying on extracurriculars, which means that at the end of the day, these jobs are gonna be distributed based on how good you are at clarinet. You know what I mean? Because all of these guys have been being trained from young, like to, to like, like this guy is like head of the junior United Nations in his high school, you know, this guy's like, founded a charity that drives dirt bikes through the Sahara Desert for some reason, you know, this guy's played the oboe at the Royal Albert Hall. And like, I was trying to become a grime MC when I was a teenager and I had a job fluffing pillows at DFS Sofa Shop in Beckton, you know? Mm. And you're like, man, like, once again, I didn't really be like, this is unfair. It was just like, what's the plan? What's the plan? This is like, as a kid, um, my life was surrounded by unfairness. I never really questioned the unfairness. It's sort of like, all right, where's the chink that I can get through? You know, the chink in the armor. And um, I just started to be really like loud in lectures and I like, start to kind of almost attack the lectures because I wanted to be like noticed. Because I figured if somebody notices me, maybe I'll get a chance. And basically it worked, right? This guy in the library, 
This guy came up to me, I was studying in the library, this, this lanky guy from North East England, a town called Grimsby, in the book is called Luke Blackwood. Just comes up to me, like, are you Gary Stevenson? And I was like, yeah. Citibank card is one trader a year through a card game, which is basically a maths game. If you win that job, you can get an internship. You should go in for the game. And I was like, damn, like, Finally, here's a way to get a job. That means I don't have to play the clarinet. You know what I mean? So like I was just, um, you, know, I was, like, you know, we've established I was very confident when it comes to, to maths. I loved games. So I went into this. This was the trading game, basically a card game. Two rounds, one LSE round and then a national final. This guy taught me the rules of the game. Um, I walked into the LSE round and there's kind of, there's like a little... This is kind of the start of like a thing that goes through my career where I kind of become successful, not so much by understanding the game, but by understanding the mindset of the people playing the game. And I knew that LSE economists would take a very mathematical approach to the game. And I knew that there would be flaws in that, basically. I took advantage of that. So I won that. I got to the final. Um, then I won. Well, whether I won the final is questionable, but I got put through to, to the internship, man. Do you want to talk more about the game or it's no what was the what was the prize at the end of the road for you like what was what was the significance of that internship if you get an intern really it's foot in the door it's foot in the door because i was confident if i got my foot in the door i'd get in but it's getting that foot in the door like that cv cover letter stage i could never get through so once you get an internship you get summer internship that's 10 weeks you spend 10 weeks in the summer in one of these banks Canary Wharf or, you know, Wall Street, if you're in the States. 50% of those interns get the job. So really, the, I was, I remember when I won that game, I went out with my mates. I got absolutely like blind drunk. I remember just running through this park in, my mates just live in London Bridge, South London, and just screaming at my mates, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be, because I, I knew, well, I was so confident. And I guess in hindsight, I was right. If I got my foot in the door, the thing is, you've got to understand, right? By then I got to LSE. You might think LSE is full of smart kids. LSE is full of rich kids. And a lot of them are not that smart. So by the time you get there and you realize that, damn, this is the competition, you know, if I can get in, I can beat these guys. The only problem is getting in. So that, that game, that game was the most important thing because the hardest thing for kids like me is not beating those guys, it's being allowed to compete. And that was my foot in the door. Mm, being allowed to compete. You know what? I'm, I'm curious if you have, like, do you have a chip on your shoulder? And, and here's the reason why I ask. So I had a similar experience where, so I grew up in London, um, but my mom has lived in America since I was young, since I was like 10 years old. And so when I'd go over to visit her in Christmas holidays, summer holidays, uh, she lives close, about an hour away from Princeton University, like one of the Ivy Leagues. And so I always had this dream of going to like a Harvard, Yale, Princeton. And as I remember going to one of their open days, I was like 15 and they basically only spoke about extracurriculars, which made it seem like it was kind of more of an equal playing, playing field, but it wasn't because the people that were getting in, you would hear these stories and they're starting charities and they're playing instruments on a world-class level or they're like junior Olympics. And you're thinking to yourself, how would I ever do that? And similar to you, I had this mindset of, I'm just gonna figure out, like I'm just gonna figure out how to get what I want. Um, and that wasn't going to an Ivy League, but I remember at the time and even now, there was a slight chip on my shoulder. And the, and the reason why is, it felt like there was this other world that I was almost barred access to. But I it was like you were barred access in a, in a way that it wasn't clear that you were barred access. It was just like the wall was so high. It was like, you're never going to be able to get in. Yeah. And I remember feeling that like, like, fuck that. Like, yeah, that chip on my shoulder. Did you have the same thing? <sighs> I think for, I remember being a teen, really when I was a teenager and I was at that grammar school and everyone else was just getting money so much easier than me. When I saw these things, when I was at LSE, you know, I think when I was at, um, at, at high school, I could see like, we're the same, but the, the game is not fair. These guys have more than me. But then when I went to LSE, 
these guys are kind of like weirdly otherworldly. They're like, they're, their lives are so bizarre that you, you kind of stop comparing yourself. And at LSE, it's so obvious that these guys are so much dumber than me and so much better off than me that it becomes almost comedic. You can't even be upset anymore. You just like the, the whole, it, the whole thing is like revealed to be kind of like a sham. Dude. And, but the thing is that they were, most of them were nice guys as well. So it was, did I, I've definitely been accused of having a chip on my shoulder. There's definitely people that, that, that say that I do. Maybe I do to some extent, obviously like, you know, the work that I do now, like I talk a lot about inequality. Um, I think it's, it's easy for me now because I was allowed to compete and, and because I won and, you know, we'll go on and talk about it, but I went on to become Citibank's top trader in the world and I made a lot of money. So, so I think if I hadn't have had that, probably I would have more of a chip on my shoulder because you're sitting there and you, you're looking at it. You're looking at these guys with everything you don't have and you know that you deserve it just as much as they do, you know. I think there's, you know, when you're like 14, 15, 16, 17. Well, for me, when I was those ages, there was a, I, I had, there was a powerlessness, which is there's an inequality and I am the victim of this. I'm the one on the wrong side of this, although I wasn't the poorest person. And it's unfair. It's unfair, but obviously now I'm a rich person and I can sit back and be like, it's unfair, but you know, I don't have to feel it emotionally. But I think, you know, I see friends of mine who are smart, who didn't get the opportunities that I had. And I think, you know, we, I sp we spoke just now about the opportunity to compete. Now I've had the opportunity to compete. I feel like I've kind of resolved these feelings, but we still live in a world where the vast majority of people never get that. So I can understand why, why people will feel that anger. And, and I think I do have it in me to a degree, but you know, I'm getting older now, so you can't stay angry your whole life. Yeah, it mellows out. You know what, you spoke about um, being the top trader at Citibank and I wanna get into, I wanna get into that experience and, and what happened at Citibank. And it's interesting because I remember even um, my first job in New York and like just walking into the office as like a complete novice, um, very idealistic in a number of ways, has no idea how anything works. And so I'm curious, can you just speak to those early moments of you working at Citibank and kind of some of the cost of characters and stories that were happening at that time? So this is really the meat of the book. Like you get onto the trading floor and these guys that I met. But um, I remember the first time I walked onto the trading floor. Um, so some people have never been on trading floor, right? It's, first of all, it's massive, massive, massive. Citibank London trading floor is enormous. You walk in, huge, huge room, and there's all of these rows of people sitting with these massive walls of monitors. So they'll have like maybe like 10, 12 monitors in front of them that sort of go up in this big sort of like, like a wall of monitors. And there's, everyone has that, bam, bam, bam. So there's everyone kind of being, these monitors like wrapping around them. And um, it's, it's, it's impressive, you see, like it, cause it's kind of like, they can definitely afford a lot of monitors, you know what I mean? And they're all there just in these long rows, very, very male space, like very, like probably less male now, but you know, 70, 80% male. And then on the trading desks, you know, I never worked with a woman, like teams of 10, 11. Um, when I first walked onto the trading floor, it was quite quiet because I came in at like 7, 7.30 in the morning. But then during the day, loud, noisy, um, lots of people shouting, lots of swearing. But I got taken around to my little desk and the desk that I ended up working on, it's called the STIRT desk, which stands for Short Term Interest Rate Trading. Um, I first interned there March 07, March 2007. Um, it was a super unpopular, unfashionable area of trading. So by that time of um, history, 2007, Trading had become like, this was the desirable job for kids of elites, which meant that basically everyone there was the same as these guys from LSE, basically. Um, kids of very wealthy families from all over the world, you know what I mean? Obviously there are some British people there. I was working for Citibank, American Bank, so lots of Americans. Um, but you know, polished, expensive suits, expensive haircuts, these kinds of guys. But the desk I was on around the sort of, in the sort of back corner, this un, unfashionable desk, because it was so unfashionable, it hadn't attracted a lot of younger traders. It was like older guys. They had like British regional accents. There was a guy there from Liverpool. There was a guy there from Australia. And there was a guy there from Norwich. And um, 
kind of they looked a little bit they looked a bit sort of rough and ready to be honest um and you know you get introduced to all the team lots of lots of big guys massive like sort of bulky guys who look like they they've been well fed you know and the they there's this kind of hazing thing where they don't give you a seat and they don't give you a desk and they don't give you any work they're just like these are the guys and then they just leave you alone and it's kind of your job to kind of like make friends somehow and they kind of like trying to like test you out like and and I just poked around to guys like hey you know do you want me to like buy your coffee it, one thing that's quite funny I think it's like a really nice um like dramatic opportunity writing the book is because I won the job in a card game I hadn't done this thing that most like LSE or Oxford or Harvard or Princeton students will have done which is they kind of memorize the language and the culture of the trading floor before they go on so then when they go on they kind of dress like a trader and they're talking like a trader even though they don't know what they're doing whereas I come in in the clothes I used to fluff pillows in at a sofa store you know what I mean and I did the same stuff I did at the sofa store which is ask the senior guys like you know do you want me to get you lunch do you want me to get you coffee and um it's nice because you can kind of learn it as I learn it from these guys and the the guys that I work with are just crazy so really there's a guy called in the book he's called Rupert who I describe as looking like he was dropped off unexpectedly at boarding school at 8 years old and not picked up till he was 21 which I later found out was not far from the truth and this guy was it totally insane totally like um kind of like a british american psychotype and he used to love taking me out drinking he used to call me Gary the geezer like I was his little artful dodger cockney sidekick and um he took me out too late one night and he got me too drunk and I, and I come in to work like after like an hour sleep threw up in the bathroom and got sent home And the next day the boss told him Gary said that it was your fault. He the boss said that to him and I was just thinking I heard the boss say that to him and I was thinking don't look at him because he's going to be furious. And I was just he used to, there was an empty seat to my left and then there was this guy Rupert. I was just trying not to look at him. And then I start hearing in the background at first like quite gently like a like a like a gentle like like a a gentle growl like <sighs> Uh, and I was just thinking don't look at him and the growl gets louder and louder like uh, and I'm just thinking don't look at him and then I hear this bang and he's under the desk there are these doors because behind there's all the computers he's kicked the doors they've banged against the metal brackets and I think I thought fucking I might be in danger here I turn around to look at him and he he was arched over to me like this and he was like growling like a wolf uh, and like gnashing his teeth like uh, uh, and me like that On, on the trading floor in front of everybody, and I just, I was just stared at the guy for like twenty. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe. You know, these guys are paid a million pounds a year, and um, you know they weren't always mad as him. But I think that does give you a little bit of a, a taste of of, of what these guys were like. I, I worked with a, a bunch of crazy guys. One guy who would insist that whenever he got drunk, his taxi driver let him stop at the Bank of England on the way home so that he could piss on the Bank of England from the alleyway behind it. Um yeah a bunch of just crazy it's amazing to write these guys crazy but not one thing I really wanted to do was I didn't want to show them like comedy wolf of wall street villains I really wanted to get under the skin like there was one time this guy Rupert he took me for a walk down like Canary Wharf through the through the skyscrapers and he just like basically destroyed the career of another trader on the desk just because he could basically and I thought he might, it, that guy was one of my mates kind of he's called Spengler in the book And I thought he might apologize to me. But instead, as we're walking, he just goes to me, "Gary, I've got a problem." And I'm like, "All right." But I'm wondering what he's going to say. He says, "When I meet someone, I have to know straight away whether they're better than me or whether they're worse than me." And I'm thinking like I was like 22, you know, it's quite a heavy conversation. He says to me, "And if they're better than me, I hate them." hate them for being better than me but if they're worse than me i despise them and it's even worse because i despise them and it was this really kind of it's weird here because this guy you can see he's obviously fucked up and on some level he knows it and he doesn't want to be that way you know what i mean and he's trying to speak to me like he's in his mid days and i'm just a, a kid really i'm 22 and you can't i wanted to show you the kind of like the tortured insides of these guys you know what i mean I, to be honest i can't really watch wolf of wall street and stuff like that you know because there's another character in my book Harry Sambi 
which is who is a mate of mine who grew up on my street, lived with his mum. I think I mentioned him at the beginning of the interview. And um, his mum passed away when he was 17. And he didn't really have nowhere to go. So basically me and the guys on the desk, we get him a job in the city. And he moves in with me, you know. And um, I kind of become like his like, surrogate dad. You know, He's like 18 and I'm like 23 or whatever, 22. And that this guy got sucked into the... The party lifestyle of the city, drugs, alcohol, women, clubs. And it messed him up so bad. It messed him up so... And he was young. This guy's 18, 19. So for me, I can't watch Wolf of Wall Street. I can't watch it because I've seen what the dark side of this industry does to people. And I went to LSE, which is kind of a finance school. And I, I studied with guys who memorised every line of dialogue of Patrick Bateman, Christian Bale, an American psycho. And I, I, I don't want to show people a glamorous side of this industry because I see what it does to young men if you put stars in their eyes. So um, the cast of characters I work, there's so many, you know, we could go on and on about the guys I worked with, but um, they were crazy, but they were real people and, and they became like family to me. And, and, and I've got a lot of love for these guys and, and I hope that comes too in the book. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I, I just think back to when I was uh, 22, 23, 24 years old, and it's your first kind of work experiences. It's the first time that you're doing all of these things, and you're in such an impressionable moment. Mm, you're, so young. you're so young, and you're like, you're looking at these people, and maybe they have certain achievements that you hope to emulate, you hope to create. They've achieved certain monetary milestones, or maybe it's where they live. Uh, the people that they know, the access, the power that they have. And so in the same way that you kind of saw the darker side of the city, of this lifestyle where you're earning a lot of money and you have influence, was there ever like a pull? Did you ever feel, it's one thing seeing it in, in a friend, but was there ever moments where you kind of started to get drawn into that? A hundred percent. I remember this guy, Rupert, when, when, when I think just after I interned, he goes to me, can you paint a flat? And I was like, yeah, probably. He goes, um, can you paint my flat? And I was like, I was like, all right. And he offered to pay me and my mates a hundred pound a day each to paint this flat. He had this super fancy flat in Clapham, which is kind of like a fancy banker area in the other side of London for me. And um, he had this th massive three floor flat didn't have no wall, didn't have no doors. It only had rotating walls. Other than the bathrooms, it had rotating, so fancy. And um, had the entire cinema floor on the bottom. And uh, obviously you see that and, you know, I would have been 20. I might have, I might have just been 21 at that time. And, you know, you bring, I'm bringing my mates from the street, you know, in overalls to come in and bait the flat. Definitely affects you. And I remember he bought, he bought all of these like tins of white paint to paint his flat and he like showed us, you know, here's your like rollers, here is your stuff, go paint the flat. And then he left. And me and my mates from the street with all these tins of white paint. My mate turns around to me and said, but it's already white. <laughs> and we were like, that, that's, a, that's what we were. It's we couldn't understand why somebody with a white flat would want to have his flat painted white. You know, obviously now I see. But yeah, you, you, you see it and you, you want it. But I think... So I didn't really go in, in detail in this in the book, but when I was still 21, when I was still studying, just before my final exams, I hadn't even started full time. This guy Rupert took me to LA and Las Vegas for like a kind of VIP trip. And we went, we went to LA and we went to like Jay-Z's after party. And it was so funny. I remember this guy Rupert, he said to me, is this in the, I don't think this is in the book. He goes to me, we're in a taxi. And one of the other traders got a nosebleed in the taxi. And I was like, are you all right? I thought it was the altitude or something. I did only now, it was only many years later I realised what probably gave him that nosebleed. And I remember this guy Rupert said to me, I've got a list of 10 questions. And if I ask any woman that ten, those 10 questions, I can ascertain with 100% certainty whether she will sleep with me or not. And I, remember, and I was like, what? And I said to him, what are the 10 questions? And he was like, and no, I can't tell you because what if you use them and then I use them later? It would be embarrassing. So I spent the whole time at Jay-Z's after party trying to like listen in on this guy to figure his 10 questions out and um i overheard him talking to some girl in like a in like a bikini next to the pool saying to her what's your chinese zodiac sign 
I'm a tiger. <laughs> that's what he said to me. I'm guessing that's question number one. Funny thing is, I'm also a tiger. And I turn around to him and goes, oh my God, I'm quite drunk by then. I said, oh my God, I'm also a tiger. You must be exactly 12 years older than me. And he looked at me like he wanted to kill me. But this guy took me, it took me to, took me to Las Vegas after that. And then we were in like these VIP nightclubs. And um, I don't know if you've been to Vegas. You live in the States. Oh. There's a lot of, you know, people pay a lot of money for these VIP tables. And okay, listen, I'm not going to judge people on what they like. For me personally, I think it's a bit weird. You're on this VIP table and like, there's these guys that are like paid to like bring girls to you, like human fishing rods, just bringing girls in. And it's like, these guys in their mid thirties, I was 21, right? So these are girls that look just like the girls I went to university with, you know what I mean? And it just, I think from very early on, I realized that I wanted the money, but I wasn't really very interested in the lifestyle and the party side of things. Like it's just, I don't want to pay girls to hang out with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't mind hanging out with girls, but I'd rather they hang out with me because they want to, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm interested even just listening to you speak. Was there ever a feeling that you just, you felt sorely out of place? I know, I know a lot of people have that like, that imposter syndrome that they don't belong somewhere causes like a loss of confidence. Was that ever the case for you? I mean, I was obviously from a very different social background, but I think what happened is very quickly was I fell in love with, or alternatively you could say became obsessed by the trading. I became obsessed with the trading. And I, I, there's a degree to which I still today am obsessed with trading. And I loved it. This, this big, this big game played by wealthy men all over the world. And, the, you know, the winner takes the spoils. Like, I loved it. I became, it, again, I think it's that maths brain part of me. I just became the trading. So at first I was kind of going around with these posh boys and I was quite different. But there was another guy on the desk um, who in the book is called Billy from Liverpool, very working class background, didn't go to university. Amazing trader. In 2008, Lehman Christ, I start working in June 2008. My specific desk starts making tons of money. And I'm just like, I want to know how to make money. I want to know how to make money. And um, I start making money and I get my first bonus. And I thought it was going to be £100,000. And it's £400,000, which at the time would have been close to $700,000. And I've become obsessed with trading, trading, trading. So really, rather than feeling like I don't fit in, I, start, I, I stop caring about the social side of it. And I, 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 I used to cycle into work. So I'd cycle in basically dressed like this and then I'd get changed on the desk. And then I started to get in early and I would trade a little bit on the desk before I got changed, before other people got in. And then before long, I would just, I completely stopped. I forgot to get changed. Like I, this thing happens, I'm so obsessed with trading. that I'm basically trading dressed like this in a hoodie on the trading floor and nothing else matters. So I'm not even thinking, do I fit in or not? It's just like I became kind of locked in to the machine and then you get like after that first bonus which is the end of part two of the book there's five parts of the book you enter this like real period of obsession obsession and I talk about my relationship with with money about I talk about love and I talk about fear and I talk about obsession but you enter that point where by the time I was sort of I'd been around long enough to ask questions about whether I fit in or not none of that mattered because all that mattered was the trading the trading it was just that was all I was. And I, I wasn't even trying to fit in because I didn't care. All I wanted to do was be the best trader in the world. Hmm. You know, I just think about, I just think about the narrative and what we, what we discussed earlier of this poor kid that grows up in Ilford in East London and is clearly talented, clearly gifted, especially uh, in math. And then you have this experience where like just before you're about to go to university and really become an adult, you get expelled from school. And in that moment, it almost seems like everything is lost, but you still navigate through, you win this trading game and you're working at Citibank and then you're becoming obsessed with the craft, obsessed with the profession of trading. And so I'm curious, what was that first moment when there starts to be a payoff from that, when the, when the poor kid from East London yeah. is now starting to make sums of money that are mind boggling, that are completely different from where he started. The weird thing is in, in a way there was never a payoff in, in well, 
Financial payoff, yes, definitely, right? So I come in 2008 and um, middle of 2008, I watched the crisis. I'm getting paid like 36,000 pounds a year, which is maybe like $50,000 a year, which is, which is a good salary, especially back then. But like, it's not like crazy, crazy money. My bonus at the end of my first like half year is 13,000 pounds. So maybe like 17, 18,000 dollars. It's that second, my first full year, 2009, I tell my boss, I want to make a bonus of hundred thousand pounds. That's what I want. Like, in my mind at that time, hundred thousand pounds was like, boom, that's the amount. My boss was leaving. So he said, you can ask me like any question. What do I have to do to make hundred thousand pounds? And he's like laughing, like you can't make hundred thousand pounds. And you're, you're only like 22. You can't make hundred thousand pounds in your first year. And um, I said to him, just tell me what I need to do. You tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. That's the kind of kid I was, I guess. And he said, you need to make $10 million for the Citibank. $10 million for the bank then you'll get paid hundred thousand pounds. And I was just like, bam, did the numbers. What's the trade, you know? And there's a whole story in the book about how I was able, because it had to put a really big trade on and it wasn't easy to do. And I had to kind of do a little bit of manipulation of people to get that trade on. But I get my massive trade on. End of the year, my PL is profit and loss is $12 million. So that, that was my target, actually. I was like a little bit margin for, for error, $2 million. And I was expecting to get paid like 120,000 pounds. And, uh, so the way it works, or the, at least the way it worked back then was you have your salary, which is just like a good salary, but nothing crazy. It's all about the bonus. And you don't get told that bonus till the end of the year. So you walk into the room and I was this, I had a new boss, massive Canadian guy who in the book is called Chuck, puts his piece of paper down on the table. And I was looking for like the number 120 or something like that. There was nothing like that number there. So I point to the number at the top of the sheet, which is 395,000 pounds. You know, back then it was about $1.6 to the pound. So it's a lot. I said to him, is it that number? He just starts laughing. He says, yeah, it's that number. And um, I, remember ex I remember word for word what I said, because I remember this is such a clear memory. I remember saying, wow, that's a lot of money. So I think it's very, the point at which I start making a lot of money is very instantaneous. It literally moment, momentary because, okay, £120,000 would have been a lot of money. But in that moment, I suddenly realized the amount that I'm making is much, much, much more than what I thought I was going to make. And um, the maddest thing is the next memory I have, and this is all in the book, is I'm sitting on the desk and I felt like I was going to start crying. It sounds stupid, right? But that's, and I myself was confused. I didn't know why I felt like that. And this guy, Billy, who's like a, you know, sort of my sort of dad on the trading floor, he, he could see that I was upset and he comes around so the other traders can't see me and he just goes, go sit outside, go take a moment. See outside on the grass. There's a little bit of grass in between the skyscrapers. I went outside and I sat on the grass. And um, the first thing I th thought about was my dad. And my dad worked for post office for 35 years. And he used to start work quite early in the morning. And um, he would take the train that went past the back of the house. And he'd be on that train at maybe like 6 a.m., maybe even before. Obviously, we wouldn't see him because he'd be gone before he'd wake up. So my mum used to wake us up to see if we could try and like wave at my dad on the train as it went past the house. Sometimes the train was too quick and we couldn't see him, but sometimes it was slow and we couldn't. That was all we saw of him, you know, and then he'd come home late in the evening, tired, you know, from work. And you think of how hard he worked for so many years for 20 grand a year. You know what I mean? And then here's me, 20, just turned 23, getting paid nearly 400 grand. And then you think, you know, the school I went to was a lot of like recently migrated kids from Pakistan. You'd go to the house and there'd be like 10 people in a small house and they'd be sleeping on sofas and stuff. You think of all of the, everyone you knew growing up and how hard all of their parents worked to live these lives of basic poverty. And then you see you're getting paid 400 grand and it's just, it's weird because obviously you think, and I think a lot of people like watching will think, I would love to be paid that amount of money. And you think if I make, get paid that money, I'll be so happy. But when it comes like that so suddenly, the truth is when that happens, in a sense, the horrific inequality of the world is revealed to you in a moment. Because you see, you know what poverty is like? You never go shopping. Everything is a hand-me-down. If you go to the shop, you buy the cheapest thing in the shop. You know what I mean? I bought, I, for, for years, for lunch, I ate two Scotch eggs, which is an hard-boiled egg wrapped in sausage meat, for those who don't know, for 75 pence. For years I ate that, for years. And then one day somebody drops 400 grand on your head and you think, all those fucking Scotch eggs, you know what I mean? But it's not just me, everybody. So it's, 
I think in maybe people will hear this and and think it's ungrateful, and maybe it is. But kind of the horror, the horror, and the because what you see in a moment is the unnecessarity of poverty. In a, in an instant, you are the, the unnecessarity of poverty is displayed to you, and you realize that me and my family and a million families like that in in this country and in America and all across the world are forced into this horrible masquerade of, of struggling for food and of keeping the heating off in the winter so that a bunch of guys in skyscrapers can make a million fucking pounds a year. So, you know, you talk about payoff, like that is the moment of the financial payoff. But in terms of payoff for me personally, I, listen, I know I couldn't do the work that I do now if it wasn't for that money. And I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for that money. But what that money showed me was that the world doesn't need to be like it is. But then at the same time, at the same time as you're having this kind of realisation, the, the first time you're maybe starting to think about things like social justice, that next voice comes into your head, which is, well, if I made £400,000, what did Rupert make? What did Billy make? What did those guys over there in the pink shirts make? What did the rest of these posh dickheads make? You know what I mean? And then it's like, well, there's a scene in the book which I think is quite nice, or I'm starting saying to myself, well, why, why them and not me? Why, why me and not, and I start listing off my kids, my, my mates from high school and from primary school. Why not us? Why not us? And it's kind of what you see there is the battle in my mind between justice and greed and the kind of rationalization of greed where I'm saying I'm doing it for Muzamil and I'm doing it for Ibran and I'm doing it for my mates in Ilford. You know what I mean? But in reality, I wanted the money. You know what I mean? And I think this is, I think this is a battle which... I think there's a degree to which anyone who ever got, comes from poverty and makes money has this battle in their heart somewhere, which is, is it right? And how much is it for me? And how much should I take? And how much should I give? And, and, and do I have responsibility to where I came from? And, you know, so these are battles which I still have with myself and anyone who knows the work that I do now and sees my YouTube will, will see, I think wealthy people from any background have responsibility to try and to, to deal with the world that they live in. But it's the moment I made that money, started a real turmoil in myself which, which continues to this day and and then you see through the rest of the book i start making more and more money and it never makes me happy basically and it's uh so where was the payoff the financial payoff was beginning of 2010 that when it started um i don't think the emotional payoff really started until the last few years when i started to do the work that i do now which is about trying to make things better i would say mm. i'm curious you know in that moment where you see that check and it's close to 400,000 pounds, and I'm just thinking about that in a dollar context, that's like over $600,000 at that point. I think if you want to bring it up to like what it actually means in this day and age, it's probably something like a million dollars, realistically. Yeah. And I'm curious, you said you understood how unnecessary poverty is. And I'm just curious... How cognizant are you of that in that moment? And is there, you spoke of this, this turmoil, like the greed balanced with the, like this social mission, like this social justice mission. And I'm curious, isn't there, is there a hint of, I just want to do this again. And I just want to do it again and again and again. And that yeah. greed side of things just like, there must be a moment of just satisfaction of like, I did it. It was too much. It was too much. It, it was too much. That amount of money was too much for me to understand. You know what I mean? Like it was just like, it was like mind blowing. Um, was there a moment of I did it? I, the thing is, I knew immediately there's a battle basically. So this social justice stuff doesn't come from the head. It comes from the body for me. So like the head, the head is saying what you're saying. This is great. This is good. This is what you worked for. This is what you deserved. And it's also saying, if you made 400, you can make 2 million. It's saying, keep going. You can make more. You can be the best. But there's something coming from the body saying this is wrong. Saying that it shouldn't be like this. And, and it, I think in, in, in essence, uh, from then on, the book is about this kind of battle. And what you see is, in my life, the, the head starts being like, trade better, trade better, trade better, trade better. And, you know, I got a good brain and it did well at it. Right? I, did, I did keep trading better and I did keep making more money. But I start to get physically sick. 
So it's kind of like the, the there's like a battle in, inside my body between my brain, which, because I was never raised, I don't come from a political family. I, I was never raised like you have a responsibility to, to drag up your social class, to protect people from where you're from. I was raised like, you know, especially the cultures I grew up around, it was get rich or die trying, you know what I mean? But something in the body says that it's wrong. You know, I think it's that, that sort of clash. So I said to myself, yeah, this is great. You deserve it. And my brain said, this is good, but something, the way that I felt was not good. And I knew that and I couldn't tell anyone. And I, and I knew, and I struggled to tell people, but it took me many, many years to really sort of pick through these emotions. And it was it, at the time, more than anything, I think I would say I was confused. I think that's probably the, the main thing that I felt. Mm. I'm curious from the vantage point you're at now like what is the what is the resolution that that feeling in the body what what do you think that is is it guilt um I think that was shock I don't you know there's you know there's a lot of debate about whether I do what I do because I feel guilty or not online <laughs> you can find a lot of it personally I don't think I'm motivated by guilt you know as we go on throughout my career I start to bet very aggressively that the economy will collapse. And there's, a, I think, quite like a poignant moment in 2011 where I put this massive bet on that the economy will collapse. And then there is the Fukushima earthquake and nuclear disaster. And I make $11 million on the back of that. And 20,000 people die. You know what I mean? And there's a question of like, should you feel guilty? You know what I mean? Because on the one hand, I made a lot of money from people dying. On the other hand, I definitely didn't cause the Fukushima earthquake. You know what I mean? And I think, I think sometimes when, when we look at society and the problems in society, there's, there's a really strong tendency to point fingers and lay blame and say like, who is at fault for this and who is wrong? And, you know, to witch hunt. And, you know, I see this happen to bankers all the time. And, um, you know, I work with a lot of bankers who are very unpleasant, but I also work with a lot of really nice guys. And I honestly think we don't get anywhere as a society by dragging people out and, and setting fire to people and saying, you are the bad guys. I'm not interested in that anymore. What I'm interested in now is fixing the problem. And that's, that's the work that I do. And um, to be honest, I don't think that's motivated by guilt. You know, I come from a poor background right? and I see what's happening to ordinary living standards of ordinary families in my country, in the States. That's people like my mum. It's people like me. And my honest belief is that if we don't do anything about rapidly growing inequality, that will get worse and worse and worse. And I don't want that to happen. So for me, if you walk down the street and you see someone's house is on fire, what do you do? You knock on the windows, you know, you call the fire brigade, you knock on the door, you scream and say, get out of the house. For me, it's not about guilt. It's about trying to stop a disaster. I think for me, that is the motivation now. But obviously, you know, when that money started to come in and I'm 23, 24, 25, you know, I was a very young man and, you know, nobody was explaining these things to me. It took me a long time to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you leave, and, and you even said it earlier, the, the best trader at Citibank and the poor kid from Ilford builds this wealth and then leaves the job like leaves, leaves it all behind for this mission. And you spoke about inequality just now, and you said that you see it as like a disaster. I'm curious why that is. What, for, for people that don't know, why is the levels of inequality that we're seeing in the UK, that we're seeing in the US, why is it so dangerous? You know, I think there's a few different ways inequality can happen. And you know, so, you remember Tony Blair, the prime minister when we were growing up. Yeah. Um, he famously said he's like intensely relaxed about inequality and he doesn't mind the rich getting richer as long as the poor are not getting poorer. And to be honest, I wouldn't necessarily be against that, you know, but there's, there's a couple of different ways inequality can grow. One is you have this booming economy and the rich take most of the gains and maybe a little bit trickles down to the rest and living standards improve a little bit for the poor and a lot for the rich. And, and I guess that's a good thing, you know. You do have risks about these guys corrupting politics or whatever. But if everybody's living standards are improving, that's better. The inequality that I discovered was, was in the aftermath of 2008, which was in a period where 
For 15 years, economists continually predicted and continue to predict economic recovery, which didn't happen. And that's, I made millions of pounds betting on that ec economic recovery not happening. And the reason I did that was because I saw huge amounts of money being poured in by governments and central banks. But when I spoke to my friends and my friends' families, they were losing their homes. None of it was getting down to them. When I look at the living standards generation by generation, they're getting worse. When I looked at the financial situations of governments, their debts are growing and growing and growing. They're, if you look at the asset holdings of governments, they're collapsing. So what you have here is a middle class losing their assets and going into debt. Global governments losing their assets and going into debt. At the same time, in the last five years, and also in the last 20 years, we've seen the, the biggest and fastest ever increases in wealth of the rich and the, and the super rich. You know? This is not inequality that is growing because our economies are exploding and the rich are taking most of the gains. This is inequality that is growing because the rich are eating the middle class and they are eating the government. And in this country, we are shutting down the welfare state, we're shutting down the healthcare, education's collapsing, the police system is collapsing, local youth services are collapsing. The rich are eating us alive. And I'm not just saying that. I bet on that year after year and I've made millions of pounds doing it. This is, not, this is not a political analysis. This is an economic analysis of one of the most successful and well-paid traders, definitely publicly speaking, in the world today. I, listen, you don't make millions of pounds speaking like me and looking like me and coming from where I'm from unless you're good. What I made millions of pounds on was by betting that the rich will eat the middle class and destroy their living standards. So listen, I'm not against inequality if it's rising all boats and if everyone's living standards are increasing. And I, I'm not a communist. I don't dream of a perfectly equal society. What I dream of is a society where people can simultaneously feed their kids and turn the heating on. And we're losing that. You know, and my dad lived in an age where you could work a regular job and support a family. And, you know, I went to school with kids who'd recently come over from Pakistan, working in shops, being able to buy houses and raise families and accumulate wealth. It was possible 20, 30 years ago, and we're losing that. And where is the wealth going? Just look at the numbers. In, in the first year of COVID, the average US billionaire doubled their wealth in one year. We paused the economy, massively increased inequality, and then we're, su then we're surprised when living standards fell. So I think we've... You know, I've studied, you know, since leaving my job, I studied at Oxford. You know, I've been at LSE, I've been at Oxford, two of the top economics universities in the world. These guys are not looking at inequality. They're not looking at it. And that inequality is going to eat your kids alive. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. And I, listen, I know this is a depressing message to deliver. Your house is on fire and you need to know that. This economic situation does not get better. It can get better if we deal with the inequality, if we deal with the tax system. But at the moment we have a tax system that makes you pay 40% and makes Elon Musk pay nothing. And Elon, Musk is, Elon Musk's kids are going to own the houses that your kids need and your kids will be poor. And, you know, some people are not going to like that message. Um, I don't need them to like it. I'm going to be right. I've been right for 15 years. I've made millions of pounds doing it. And I'll be right whatever happens, you know, because this analysis is right, you know. People can go and look at my video on my YouTube called How the Rich Get Rich from COVID-19, June 2020. June 2020, put that video out. And it said that after COVID... There'd be a massive increase in inflation, a collapse in living standards, a massive increase in inequality, a massive increase in house prices and stock prices and the gold price. Every single one of those predictions has happened. There's a reason the banks pay me millions of pounds a year, mate. I'm good at this. I'm good at this. And if I did not do what I do now, if I instead continued working for a bank, I would be 10 million pounds richer than I am now. I do the work that I do now because I do not want the economy and living standards to collapse for ordinary families, like your family, like my family, like the families of the people watching this show. That's why I do the work that I do, and hopefully people will listen, because if people understand what's gonna happen, then we can work together to stop it. Yeah, you know what, you say, you say the rich are eating the middle class, and you know, I really wanna put it into perspective for people, because I think so often we hear like, we hear almost like headlines or, or lines like that, and, we hear it, but we don't truly understand what it means. And so when you say that the rich are eating the middle class, how, at a high level, I'm sure there's so many different reasons and, and how it happens, but at a high level, how does something like that even take place? So the main thing is, 
the first thing you need to recognize is the rich have unbelievably enormous amounts of passive income. So in this country, the prime minister, Rishi Sunak, is worth 700 million pounds. Okay. He will make 5% a year on that, which means he'll make 35 million pounds a year, which means he'll make a million dollars a week, passive income, passive income. And there's much richer people out, you know, Elon Musk is worth 200, 300 billion, you know, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, all these guys are worth hundreds of billions. So these guys will be making, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds of, of, of dollars a week, passive income. If you were making $10 million a week passive income, how much would you spend? To be honest, it's such a yes. mind-boggling number that you're if, like... If you, if you spend even $100,000 a week, you're living like the fucking queen, right? You're living an unbelievably yeah. luxurious life, right? So you, you spend $100,000 a week. You're still... You've got, you've got $10 million a week left over. There's nothing that you can do with that, especially in an economy which is not aggressively growing. There's nothing you can do other than lend the money out, which puts governments and people into debt, or buy the assets, buy the rest of the assets. So these guys basically have no choice but to buy the assets of the middle class. And the way that works in practice is you have some assets, you know, you're not a super wealthy guy. You get to your old, old age, you retire. You need to sell those assets to pay for your retirement, to pay for your end of life care. All of that money goes to rich people as passive income and they give that money to their kids and then their kids buy the assets from you and give it to their kids. That's what that, that is what is happening. That is what, and also, you know, Governments, the same thing is happening. As poverty grows, governments are forced to borrow money from the rich in order to support the growing masses of poor who can't afford things like food, who can't afford things like housing. So the government goes more and more in debt to the rich. Fundamentally, there is a, there is a competition of power here. As the rich get phenomenally rich and phenomenally powerful, they compete with you and your kids for resources. How can you compete for resources with somebody who has a $10 million a week passive income? You can't, you know, and I think if you look, at, you know, we're talking now in, in 2024 and, and we're, we're on the back end of really a golden 70 years or even in the States, maybe 100 years of living standards for the middle class. OK, we have lived through a period where people like our parents have been able to provide decent standards of living for their kids on regular wages. That is not the historical norm. If you look at the past 2000 years of history, most of history is a small group of, ex of extremely wealthy people and a vast mass of extremely impoverished people. And that is because you get dynamics like what is happening now. When you have very, very powerful people, they can use that power to buy the assets of less powerful groups, which at the moment is the middle class and the government. The only reason we didn't have that is because for 100 years, we taxed very rich people at extremely high rates and that prevented them from accumulating the rest of the assets. If you look at human history, Human history is the powerful use their power to dispossess the weak and you tend towards extremely high levels of inequality. That is obviously where we're going. And, you know, I know the people watching, we're mainly in the States. We have some people here in, the, in Britain. These are countries that have strong middle classes. This is not normal. You know, go to India, go to Nigeria, go to South Africa, go to Brazil. You will see countries where most people have nothing. And this is what happens when you allow the rich to eat the middle class. You know, you... How do the poor defend themselves from the rich? How does the middle class depend, defend themselves from the rich? How do you defend yourself? How do you defend your assets from somebody who has a passive income of $10 million a week? You know, there's no, way, there's no way to do it other than the tax system. And, you know, I'm not a, in my heart, I'm not a high tax guy. And, and I want to make clear, I'm not saying we want to tax more doctors, lawyers, teachers, you know, heaven forbid, heaven forbid even bankers, maybe not even YouTubers, right? This is about families who have wealth of $100 million, a $1 billion. These guys, you can't compete with them. They will get your stuff. The only way to protect yourself from them is the tax system. I think we need to start viewing these guys as what they are, which is an invading army taking all the assets, you know. That's what it is, you know. They're rich, you're poor, they have a huge passive income. It comes from you. They will use that to buy your assets. Hmm. I'm curious when you say when you say assets, that's like homes, property mainly? Like what Yeah, I mean for the middle class in, in the UK and the US especially in the UK assets is mainly housing. Um, but, you know, also like your share of the stock market, you know, they're increasingly dominating ownership of commercial assets, shares of the stock market, these kinds of things. Um, but they can also, they can put you into debt. You know, I think the main, the main two ways are, you know, you're competing with them to buy things, right? These guys got loads of money. You don't have much money. He can pay way more than you. So the only way to compete is to borrow tons of money from him. So you end up in a situation where the only way to buy things like housing are to borrow enormous amounts of money from the rich. So I think that basically the two ways that you see loss of, of wealth of the middle class are 
literally less ownership of assets. And in, in the UK, that's primarily housing. In the US, it's also primarily housing, but the US does have sort of stock and share ownership. You will see these guys own less, a smaller percentage of the stock market, a smaller share of housing. But the other thing is just much higher levels of debt. So, I mean, you really, you know, people our age, if you speak to people our age, you can see it. These guys, number one, much less likely to own property than their parents were at the same age. Number two, if they do own property, the amount of debt they have compared to what their parents had at the same age is absolutely enormous. That is the loss of the wealth of the middle class. And the exact same thing has happened to governments. They're privatizing assets. They're losing assets. They're going into debt. And the question you need to ask yourself is, we can't all lose our assets, right? They're not disappearing. Someone has to own them. And we can't all go into debt. Debt is always to somebody. So as the middle class is accumulating these massive mortgage debts and student debts, especially in the US, and the government is accumulating these massive government debts, someone is on the other side of that. Somebody is on the other side of that. Since the beginning of COVID, the US government has run a deficit of $10 trillion, which is $80,000, $80,000 per US taxpayer. Somebody has that money. So if you are a US taxpayer and you are not $80,000 richer and your husband or wife is not $80,000 richer and every single one of your adult children or parents is not $80,000 richer, someone else has your $80,000. That is an unbelievably enormous amount of money. And this is what I could see from the beginning of COVID this money would accumulate to the richest. So that is why I was able to correctly predict the, this enormous asset price rally, which will continue because the rich have accumulated so much money. And it is not politics of envy to say if the rich accumulate money, that's a problem for you. If the rich accumulate money, they will use that money to buy assets and resources you need. And then you can't be surprised when rents go up. You can't be surprised when energy costs go up. You can't be surprised when food costs go up. Money is the resource that we use to distribute the rest of the resources. If rich people are accumulating an enormous amount of money and ordinary families are not, then ordinary families will get less resources, less heating, less housing, less food. One thing I think is really, really important to understand. If I give you and all of your mates $1,000 each and I give every rich person a million dollars each, your life will get worse because money is a distributional resource. And this is why, you know, I know people don't like me talking about distribution. Distribution matters, you know. We don't live on an infinite planet. If you're giving a bigger share of the resources to the rich than the rest of us, we'll get less and less. And that is what is happening. And the big concern is it accelerates. Because if you can't run a balanced budget when you own your own home, what happens to your kids when they don't own their own home? You know, so, and then and who owns that house now? The rich. So this will spiral. As a mathematician, what I see is a system spiraling dangerously out of control. And I'm phenomen phenomenally pessimistic about what happens to the economy. But, because you know, I don't like to deliver just purely pessimistic messages, the flip side of that is, if we actually deal with this growing inequality, we can start to see the fruits of this enormous economic growth we've had over the last 30, 40 years start to reach real people. That is what we can see. If we actually deal with this growing distributional problem, we can enormously increase living standards enormously increased living standards. But that is not the direction we are going in. The direction we are going in at the moment is rapid increases in inequality. And that will lead to continued rapid decreases in living standards. Mm. There's a quote that I think really well kind of sums up the dynamic that you are speaking to. Um, this article online and this person posts this, he says, I'm finding it increasingly difficult not to be scared about the future and angry about the past. I'm 35 years old, the oldest millennial, the first millennial. And for a decade now, I've been waiting for adulthood to kick in. My rent consumes nearly half my income. I've had a steady job since Pluto was a planet and my savings are dwindling fast. Faster than the ice caps, the, bo the baby boom has melted. We've all heard the statistics. More millennials live with their parents than with roommates. We are delaying partner marrying and house buying and kid having for longer than any previous generation. And according to the older generation, our problems are all our own fault. Listen, it doesn't need to be that way. We're doing all this. The reason we do this, the reason we're doing this is so Jeff Bezos can have a bigger yacht and Elon Musk can have a fifth helipad on the top of his skyscraper. If we deal with inequality, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, things can be better, but only if we work together to bring inequality down. Sweet. Uh, I loved having you on, man. Thank you Thanks so much. Boss. Nice to meet you.